Beloved, this is Minister S.N. Crockett Jr. with Jesus Christ our Lord Christian Fellowship. The truth of the gospel, the truth of the gospel. I'm coming to you tonight, the 19th of May, the 19th of May of 2022. And uh, we are in Revelation, we are in chapter 6, we're in the first two verses where we, we said that Jesus in chapter 5 was the only one who could take the scroll. The scroll represents the title deed to the earth. Jesus came to the Father, took the scroll out of the Father's right hand in Revelation 5. And now Jesus is going to loose the seven seals of the scroll. This scroll represents the title deed to the earth. The Lord Jesus is about to take the earth back from Satan. Let me say that again. The Lord Jesus, by taking the title deed, the scroll, he's about to take back the earth from Satan. He accomplished uh, our redemption for sin on the cross. That's, there's no negating that. But all of creation has to be redeemed. All of creation, not just mankind. All of creation has to be redeemed. The Apostle Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 8. And so when he takes the scroll out of the Father's right hand, because remember in Revelation 5, John, uh, the, uh, John said, I looked and nobody was found in heaven or earth or even under the earth who was found worthy to look upon the scroll or to loose the seven seals. And John said, I wept much. John said, I wept much because nobody was worthy. So that means John must have known the significance of the scroll. And so, uh, uh, and then the elder, one of the 24 elders said, weep not, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll, to look upon it, to open the seals, etc. And then when John looked, he didn't see a lion. He saw a lamb as though it had been slain, but it was standing. That would be our Lord Jesus Christ with the marks of homicide, the marks of murder on him, but yet standing, meaning he's been raised from the dead. And John, this scene is taking place in heaven, so Jesus has ascended to heaven as he did in Acts. He ascended to heaven in a cloud. The angel said, the same Jesus who ascended into heaven will so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And so remember, Revelation 1, 2, and 3 took place on earth. Revelation 4 and 5 took place in heaven. And now we're at Revelation 6, we're back to the earth again. Earth, heaven, earth, heaven, earth, heaven, earth, heaven, earth, heaven. And so Jesus now is about to loose the six of the seven seals. He's not going to loose the seventh seal until uh, later. He's going to lose six of the seals in, in Revelation chapter 6. I'm not going to get into uh, the other seals tonight. I'm going to continue to talk about the first seal. Remember the first four seals of the six, the four of the first six seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Even, even unbelievers uh, know about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Even a cursory knowledge of Revelation, unbelievers, many of them, they'll know the four horsemen of the apocalypse. As I said uh, um, several times, there was a movie made years ago with Glenn Ford. He was one of my favorite actors. He's gone on now. But he made a movie called The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. It had nothing to do with the book of Revelation and prophecy. It was a book relate. It was a movie related to uh, Nazi Germany, that, that whole thing. But it was called The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And even in the movie, they showed uh, visions of these horses are, you know, riding in the storm, so to speak. Let's pray and let's spend a few minutes uh, in Revelation chapter 6. We want to talk about, do you, do you discern the spirit of Antichrist? Because John said that Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists, whereby you know that it is the last hour. Paul said the mystery of iniquity is already at work. He said that in 2 Thessalonians. The mystery of iniquity is already at work. So he's really saying the same thing. He was really saying the same thing that John said. John said the Antichrist, capital A, he shall come. But even now there, there, there are many Antichrists, the spirit of Antichrist. And we're going to talk about that for the next few sessions about the spirit of Antichrist. Antichrist means against Christ, and it also means as an alternative to Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about that tonight, Sunday. We're going to talk about it for a while. I'll, I'll be a while on the first seal, the first horseman. All right, let's pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we bless you, we praise you, we thank you for the privilege of mentioning your name. In the name of your holy son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Bless this teaching, Lord. Bless our hearts to receive it, Lord. 
Bless sinners to be saved. Bless, bless saints to be encouraged, Lord, and enlightened. By the illuminating power of your Holy Spirit, by Jesus Christ, we pray. Please forgive us for our sins, Lord. Help us, Lord, to discern between the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of Antichrist, which is against the gospel of your dear Son. By Jesus Christ, we ask these things. We ask that as a result of this teaching and preaching and teaching and preaching all over the world, we pray there will be a great manifestation of fruit and gifts and gifts and fruit of the Holy Spirit, according to your good, acceptable, and perfect will. By Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so we now come to the part of Revelation that's commonly known uh, as the four horsemen um, of the apocalypse. And uh, in the scriptures, horses are sometimes used to indicate the carrying out of God's sovereign will. We see it in Zechariah. Remember, companion books to Revelation would be prophetic books like Zechariah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zephaniah. Companion books. The, there are many allusions from the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. There are hundreds of allusions. That's why to properly understand, that's why to properly understand Revelation, you have to have a working knowledge. You don't have to be a scholar. I'm not an Old Testament scholar. Uh, but you have to have a working knowledge, a willing working knowledge of the Old Testament. If you do that, then you can understand Revelation better because Revelation is really, to be honest with you, Revelation is a compilation of the other 65 books of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, the 39 books of what we call the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible. And so you'll see all these allusions, not direct quotes, not direct quotes, but you'll see allusions allusions back to the Old Testament. So when you see the four horsemen of the apocalypse in Revelation uh, 6, then it's an allusion back to Zechariah and, and, and possibly other scriptures that deal with horses that carry out the will of God. So in the scriptures, horses are sometimes used to indicate the carrying out of God's sovereign will. These four horsemen in Revelation 6 were white, red, black, and pale. White, red, black, and pale. We're not going to spend any time on the red, black, and pale tonight. We're going to concentrate on the four, the first horseman, the first horseman, the first horseman. Each horse and its horseman was called forth to execute God's divine purpose as it pertains to reclaiming all of creation for the kingdom of God in Christ. Let me read to you Revelation chapter 6. I'm just going to read the first two verses. I'm not going to go beyond that tonight. Revelation chapter 6. I'm going to read to you from the King James Version. Revelation chapter 6. Remember, Jesus has taken the scroll out of the Father's hand. And John said, I saw when the Lamb, that would be Jesus, opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of the four creatures, King James says beast, but creatures is a better translation. One of the four creatures saying, come and see, or come. He's, he's, he's really speaking to the horseman, the horse and its rider. He's not speaking to John because John is already there observing. He's speaking to the horse and its rider. And I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Let me read that again. And I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. So that's the white horse. That's the first, that's the first horseman. That's the first horseman of the apocalypse. All right, so soon as my as soon as my um audio visual catches up here, we can continue. That's the first horseman of the apocalypse. Now people are gonna think because it's a white horse, and because the person on it is wearing a crown, many people automatically surmise that that's our Lord Jesus Christ, and it's not. And I'm gonna to talk to you about that tonight. But people think because they see the, because they see the, uh, because they see the color white, so they, because they see the color white, and they see that the individual is wearing a crown. If, if I can get my, if I can get my audio visual here to line up. And because they see the individual wearing a crown, they think it's our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so here's where we are. We would now discuss each of the four horsemen as well as the fifth, sixth, and seventh seals. But again, I'm not going into anything tonight except the first horseman, which is Revelation 6, verses 1 and 2. All right, so here we go. 
All right, so it's taking my audio visual a little while to catch up. All right, okay. But anyway, so the first, so the first horseman comes forth. All right, and uh, and unfortunately, many assume because this first horseman is riding a white horse and wearing a crown that he is Jesus Christ our Lord because he's wearing because people associate white with holiness and purity and that is a, a correct assumption a, cor a, a correct connection correlation but people so people say oh he's, it's a white horse and the guy is wearing a crown okay but but notice he's carrying a bow but there's nothing but a bow and I'm going to give you some reasons why this is not our Lord Jesus Christ this is an imposter this is an imposter this is the antichrist this is a false prophet this is a this is a satanic imitation of our Lord Jesus Christ all right. Reason number one, whenever Jesus, our Lord, is mentioned in Revelation, even when describing his sacrifice for our sins, he is mentioned in terms of exaltation, power, glory and his eternal kingdom. You would never see Jesus mentioned in Revelation as a guy on a horse with a bow that, that even when Jesus is mentioned in his humiliation, he, he gave himself for our sins, etc. He's but, he, but it's, he's mentioned in exalted terms. Look at Revelation 1, 5 through 11. Look at John's description of Jesus going back to chapter 1. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the first to be raised from the dead, who is also the ruler of the kings of the world. Do you hear that? Even in talking about his crucifixion and resurrection, even in talking about his crucifixion, he's mentioned in exalted terms. He loves us, and by his sacrificial death, he has freed us from our sins. But notice, even in talking about his sacrifice on Calvary's cruel cross, he's still mentioned in exalted terms. He, he, that guy on the horse there, that first horse, that is not our Lord Jesus Christ. It's an imposter. He's going to come as Antichrist. He's, the Antichrist is going to come and he's going to obtain power by flattery. He's going to obtain power by a peaceful method, which is probably why he has a bow, but no arrow. He will probably obtain power by diplomacy, by flattery, by, by uh, bamboozling nations and leaders because the world is going to be so weary at that time whenever this takes place, sometime after the rapture of the church. The world would be so weary for a leader, just like Germany was so weary for a leader after they had been defeated and humiliated in World War II, in World War I, excuse me, then who steps forward? Adolf Hitler. And the people embraced him as though he were a Messiah. And you see where he led the German nation. All right. So reason one, reason number one, why the man on the white horse, the entity on the white horse is not our Lord Jesus Christ. Reason number one, whenever Jesus, our Lord is mentioned in Revelation, even when describing his sacrifice for our sins, he is mentioned in terms of exaltation, power, glory, and his eternal kingdom. All right. Reason number two, Jesus himself is opening the seven seal scroll. It wouldn't make sense for him to open a scroll in which he then describes himself, especially in terms where he is less exalted than the Jesus who opens the seven seal scroll. Because notice, if you go back to Revelation five, the lamb went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who sits on the throne, who sits on the throne, the father. If you go back to Revelation 4 and 5, remember I told you Revelation 4 and 5 take place in heaven. John was invited to come up to heaven and he saw a vision of the throne of God. And he saw God on his throne in Revelation 4 and he saw Jesus in Revelation 5 as, as, as the lamb who had been slain but resurrected. And he saw where Jesus went and took the scroll out of the right hand of the individual sitting on the throne. That individual is the father. Reason number three, that the man on the, on, the, on the white horse is not Jesus. If this were Jesus going forth to conquer, why are the following three horsemen wreaking havoc on the world and accomplishing the exact opposite of what Jesus our Lord stands for? If, G, if that was Jesus going forth to conquer, then the, the, then the next three horsemen, it would only make sense that they would be in submission to Jesus. That they would be that, that they would be horses of peace and prosperity and millennial kingdom, etc. But no, the first horseman is Antichrist, and the next three horsemen are the results of the Antichrist taking power. 
Remember, the first horseman comes with a bow, but no arrow. He comes in peace by diplomacy and flattery, right? By a skillful tongue. But then all hell breaks loose. And that's where you see the red horse, war, famine, death. Then you see a black horse, famine and death. And then the last horse, the fourth horseman, is a pale horse, death and Hades. Death and Hades. Death and Hades. Death and Hades. And so reason number three, if this were Jesus going forth to conquer, uh, why are the following three horsemen wreaking havoc on the world and accomplishing the exact opposite of what Jesus our Lord stands for? All right. Okay. Next. Let's see what we have here. Let me see if I can move this slide into position. Reason number four, whenever our Lord Jesus fights against his enemies, he uses one of the attributes describing him in Revelation chapter one. He is never described as having a bow, especially one without, especially a bow without what would accompany, accompany the bow and arrow. Listen to Revelation chapter one. Jesus had in his right hand seven stars. Those are the angels, the messengers of the seven uh, churches. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. That's his word coming forth in judgment. That's how Jesus is going to destroy the enemy. That's how Jesus is going to destroy the Antichrist. He's going to destroy the Antichrist by the word of his mouth and by the brightness of his coming or his Shekinah glory. He's not destroying the Antichrist with a bow and no arrow. That is not our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance, or his appearance, was as the sun shining in his strength. And John said, when I saw him, because he saw the glorified Jesus, he essentially saw the same Jesus whom he saw at the Mount of Transfiguration, but with a few differences. He says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. In other words, he was what we call slain in the spirit. So whenever Jesus is described in Revelation, because Revelation emphasizes the glory, the power, the majesty, the dominion, the kingdom, the eternal, the eternality, the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever Jesus is described in Revelation, even in his humiliation in chapter five and chapter one, etc., he's still described in terms of power, glory. No more being slapped around by the Romans. No more walking up the Via Dolorosa carrying his cross. And then another man, a black man, had to carry his cross for him. No more crown of thorns on Jesus. It's going to be diadem crowns if you go to Revelation 19. No more humiliation being slapped around. No more being spit upon. No more Romans spitting upon him saying, prophesy to us uh, who slapped you. No, no more. No mas. In the revelation, Jesus comes in power and glory and magnificence and kingdom. And that's why the devil doesn't want you to read Revelation because Revelation reveals who Jesus is, the ascended Christ, Jesus coming in power and glory, Jesus, the head, the Lord of the churches, Jesus Christ wearing diadem crowns, Jesus Christ, the head of the eternal kingdom, a kingdom hewn out of the mountain without hands, Jesus Christ, our Lord, that rider on that first horse is not our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, John said, little children, it is the last time and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Watch what he says here. Even now are there many Antichrists. You hear that? Little children, John said 2000 years ago. Little children, it is the last time. Prophetically, that could last thousands of years as we've seen. The last days really began if you really want to know the truth, the last days really began when Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead. And then, of course, the church was established at Pentecost. That was really the beginning of the last days. So anything from that time onward is the last is considered the last days. The Jews have really two time periods. Uh, they let's see. I probably shouldn't have said it because I can't remember those two time periods. Uh, there's, there's, the, there's the period of the Messiah when Messiah shall rule and of course that'll be Jesus and there's the time of the Gentiles right now we are living in the time of the Gentiles where the Gentiles have rule over the earth but one day the Gentiles will no longer have rule over the earth but Jesus will rule from his throne in Jerusalem he will sit on King David's throne and he will rule in righteousness but right now we're in the time of the Gentiles that's why the Bible talks about uh, 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 certain things happening until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So right now we're living in the time of the Gentiles where the major world powers are Gentile powers. But that time is coming to a close. All right. So no, this individual on the white horse represents either the Antichrist and or the many false prophets who will rise up during the time of Jacob's trouble. 
which comes from Jeremiah 30 and 7. Jacob's trouble would be the seven years of tribulation, especially the last three and a half years of the tribulation, which are known as the Great Tribulation, where the Antichrist will try to destroy Israel. And he will sit in the temple of God as though he is God. What, what Daniel called the abomination that makes desolate, the abomination of desolation. So the first guy on the horse, on that white horse, not our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, look at this right here. There's a direct correlation or relationship between Revelation chapter 6 and Jesus our Lord's Olivet Discourse, which is Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, and parts of Luke 21. All right, false Christ, Matthew 24, 4 and 5. Rider on a white horse, Revelation 6, 1 and 2. Wars and rumors of wars, Matthew 24, 6 and 7. Rider on a red horse, Revelation 6, 3 and 4. Famine, Matthew 24, 7. Rider on a black horse, Revelation 6, 5 and 6. Famines and plagues, Matthew 24, 7, Luke 21, 11. Rider on a pale horse, Revelation 6, 7 and 8. Persecution and martyrdom of saints, Matthew 24, 9 and 10. Martyrs, Revelation 6, 9 through 11. Terrors and great cosmic signs, Luke 21, 11. Terror, Revelation 6, 12 through 17. Worldwide preaching of the gospel, Matthew 24, 14. Ministry of the 144,000 Jews, Revelation 7, uh, verses 1 through 8. So notice the direct correlation between what Jesus our Lord said in Matthew, what we call the Olivet Discourse, because he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, his disciples asked him several questions. Lord, because they were because they were marveling at the temple, at the stones of Herod's temple, Herod had added to the Jewish temple, and they were marveling at the stones, and they were just all impressed, and Jesus, of course, he's not impressed with the same things we're impressed with. Jesus said, don't you see all these things? Not one stone will be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. And that prophecy of Jesus was fulfilled in 70 AD when Titus, Flavius Titus and the Roman legions came and destroyed Jerusalem and tore down the temple. But he gave what's called the Olivet Discourse. They asked him several questions. When will these things occur? What will be the sign of your coming? And what will be the sign of the end? He answered all three questions. And so Revelation 6 coincides with Matthew 24, Luke 21, parts of Luke 21, and parts of Mark 13. No, this rider on a white horse initially conquers by peace. You see that? He comes on a white horse. He's got a bow, no arrow. So he initially conquers by peace, but it is a peace that will be eventually shattered as evidenced by the three horsemen that follow. And of course, I'm not getting into those horsemen tonight. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 3, when people say everything is quiet and safe, then suddenly destruction will hit them. It will come as suddenly as the pains that come upon a woman in labor, and people will not escape. So you see the first horseman comes with a bow, but no arrow, white horse, crown, peace. But the next three horses, war, famine, plague, death, Hades. So those scriptures in, Reve in, 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 in Revelation chapter 6 coincide with this scripture here in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 3 and in other passages. Revelation 6, 1 and 2, the rider on the white horse, that ain't Jesus. That's the Antichrist. John said, I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a, a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. He, he was on a white horse, okay, a white horse. Just because he's on a white horse doesn't mean that he's a godly individual. He, he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. He had a bow but no arrow. I think that's significant. Many other commentators think that's significant. He had a bow but no arrow, and a crown was given unto him. So someone gave him power and authority. A crown was given unto him. All authority ultimately comes from God. But God allows Satan to give others authority to, for the purpose of fulfilling God's will. I know we don't understand that. We, we, we want God to be all tipped through, through, through the two lips. And, uh, you know, God is good. He is good, but God uses evil men and evil entities to, to, to um, achieve his will. 
And we might as well get used to that because it's a, it's a, it's a biblical truth. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. We live in an age of unfortunate deception, which is accomplished through the lies of Satan. Jesus said concerning Satan, he was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth. There is no truth in him. He is a liar and the father of lies. He was a murderer from the beginning, Jesus said. He does not stand in the truth. There is no truth in him. He is a liar and the father of lies. When he tells a lie, Jesus said he speaks of his own because he's a liar. Satan is a liar. That's why God doesn't want us to lie. Because if, when we lie, we, in essence, we agree with the devil because the, he's the father of lies. What does it mean to be the father of lies? The father of lies means to be the originator of something. You are of the, Jesus said in John 8, 44, you are the children of your father, the devil. He was speaking to those Jews who did not believe in him. In Revelation, he called them the synagogue of Satan. And you want to follow your father's desires. From the very beginning, he was a murderer and he has never been on the side of truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he is only doing what is natural to him. You see that? That's why as believers, we're not supposed to lie because, that, because that's our natural man. That's our sinful nature. But our spiritual man, the, the man or the woman or the individual uh, who wants to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not supposed to lie because lying is of the devil. He is only doing what is natural to him because he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14 and 6. It means that Satan is the originator, the producer, and marketer of all that is slanderously false. He is the exact opposite of our Lord Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Satan lies. Jesus, the truth. Satan lies. Jesus, the truth. Satan, the father of lies. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. All right. So as soon as my, as soon as my audio visual catches up, we'll continue. All right. So what, what does Satan do? As we're going to learn in the next few lessons, Satan comes to deceive people into accepting an alternative to Jesus another Jesus, another Christ. Remember how he deceived Eve? Eve said, God has commanded us not to eat of the tree of the garden of, of, uh, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then Satan said, no, God didn't say that. What, 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 you, what he really said was, God does know. In other words, Satan added to what God had said. And he bamboozled Eve. And the Bible says Eve was deceived. She even admitted herself, I was deceived. Adam sinned, but he wasn't deceived. Adam sinned willfully. You can be deceived, but you can also sin willfully. Eve was deceived. Adam sinned willfully. Eve was deceived. Adam sinned willfully. Eve was deceived. Adam sinned, uh, Adam, uh, sinned willfully. All right, so it only stands to reason that if Satan is the father of lies, watch this, his ministers, his apostles, his minions are also merchants of lies. Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen through 27, well, no wonder even Satan can disguise himself to look like an angel of light. So it is no great thing if his servants disguise themselves to look like the servants of righteousness. They will receive their just rewards. See, we think Satan is coming with a pitchfork and a long red tail. No, no, no. He's coming as an angel of light. Revelation 2.20, Jesus said to the church of Thyatira, but I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. She calls herself a prophetess. And by her teaching, she deceives my servants to commit sexual immorality. The King James says fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. You see that? That church allowed, allowed a false teacher, a false prophetess to come in there. And, 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 and present the spirit of Antichrist, another Christ, another gospel, an alternative to the glory and majesty, the true Jesus Christ, our Lord. Listen to what Jesus said to uh, the church at Ephesus. I know your works and your labor and your patience and how you cannot bear them which are evil. And you have tried them which say they are apostles. You hear that? You tried them by the spirit of God. You tried them 
who say they are apostles and are not. You found them to be liars. Ah, you found them to be liars. So if these false apostles are liars, who's their daddy? You know who their daddy is. Their daddy is Satan. I know your works, Jesus said to the church of the Ephesians. I know your labor. I know your patience. How you cannot bear them which are evil. And you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And you have found them liars. It is the little children. It is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists. Even now are there many Antichrists. Even now are there many Antichrists. You see that? The Antichrist shall come, capital A. The, the Antichrist, the, 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 the beast of Revelation 13, Revelation 17, 2 Thessalonians 2, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. The beast of Daniel chapter 7, the little horn, ja Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 11. The, the, the Antichrist, the Antichrist. But, but even now, John said, there are many Antichrists. In other words, John in his day, as well as Paul and the other apostles and teachers and prophets, etc., they were dealing with, even in the early church, even in the early church, they were fighting against heresies. They were fighting against false teachings that sought to undermine the glory, the majesty, the power, the dominion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, Satan's biggest lie, his final act, will be the introduction of a man who has many titles, but is mostly known as the Antichrist. He has many titles, many. We'll get into some of them another time. But he has many, many titles in the Old Testament and New Testament, but mostly in the Old Testament. Many titles. But he's, he's mostly commonly, he's most commonly known as the Antichrist, which means against Christ or an alternative to Jesus Christ. The Antichrist. Against Christ. Or an alternative to Christ. Notice that the Apostle John said that before the Antichrist comes on the scene, even now there are many Antichrists. This means that spirit of, of deception has been in the world since the Garden of Eden. When Satan tricked Eve into accepting an alternative to God's way. Genesis 3.1 Now the serpent was more subtle. You hear that? Subtle. He doesn't come with a pitchfork and a red tail. He was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. You see that? He came to undermine God's commandments. 1 Timothy 2.14 It was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman, being Eve, who was deceived and deluded and fell into transgression. <coughs> Genesis 3.4 But the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. God said, you shall surely die. If you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Not physically die, but spiritually die. But the serpent undermined the commandments of God. The serpent said to the woman, no, you shall not surely die. Now I wonder who was right. God was right because when they ate of it and their eyes were open and they saw that they were naked, they had to give an account to God and they were evicted from the garden of Eden and a curse was placed upon the earth. Thorns and thistles, God said that you're going to have to you're going to have to work through thorns and thistles as you try to harvest your, your your daily bread. Guess what kind of crown Jesus wore when he went to the cross? He wore a crown of thorns, indicating that he took our curse. He took the curse that God had placed upon the earth and upon mankind. He took that curse upon himself when the Romans shoved a spiny and hurtful crown of thorns into his lovely brow. Any teaching, doctrine, sermon, political statement which denies who Jesus is and his teachings, as well as the teachings of his holy apostles and prophets, is the spirit of Antichrist. Here are some examples. Is Jesus the only way to heaven? You see that? People who question that. That's the spirit of Antichrist. If Christ, has Jesus been raised from the dead? That was an issue that the Apostle Paul had to deal with with the Corinthian church. He devoted a whole chapter, chapter 15, to the resurrection both of Jesus and of the just ones, the saints. Is Jesus God? Those who question the divinity, the deity of Jesus, cults like Jehovah's Witnesses who question the deity, the divinity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now look at this next slide coming up here. 
in a, in a now well-known television clip, media celebrity Oprah Winfrey, a, a fierce proponent of new age teachings, she openly denied. This was years ago. Whether she's changed her mind, I don't know. But in this television clip that's still on YouTube, she openly denied that Jesus Christ is the only way to eternal life. She, she, she said it's impossible that there's only one way. She, and, and these women in the audience, if you've seen the YouTube clip, the women in the audience were standing up for the gospel. God bless them. They were standing up for the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But of course, Oprah had the mic. And this was when she had her daytime uh, show in the afternoon. And she said, impossible. There cannot be just one way to eternal life. So in that instance right there, Oprah Winfrey, celebrity mogul, Oprah Winfrey, billionaire, Oprah Winfrey, model to you know millions of, of women, etc., was walking in the spirit of Antichrist because she was denying the basic teaching of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his holy apostles and prophets when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that nobody can come to the Father except by me. When his holy apostles said, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved but in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. John said, who is a liar? The Apostle John, not Crockett. The Apostle John said, who is a liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is Messiah, Savior, the Anointed One, the Chosen One of God. Such a person is the Antichrist, John said, and he didn't stutter, he didn't blink, he didn't run and hide. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. Jesus said in John 5 and 23 that all men must honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. It is not enough to just say you honor the Father if you dishonor the Son. By denying that Jesus is the only way to the Father, Oprah was walking in the spirit of the Antichrist. Let me say that again. By denying, by denying that Jesus is the only way to the Father. Because she, she, she adamantly said, no, it's impossible. There cannot be just one way. By denying that Jesus is the only way to the Father, Oprah at that time, and that clip is, uh, you know, 25, 30 years old. I don't know where, where, where she is now with the Lord. I have never heard her confess, you know, that, you know, that Jesus is Lord and he's the only way, he's the way, the truth, and the life. So but I'm going by this clip here. By denying that Jesus is the only way to the Father, Oprah was walking in the spirit of the Antichrist. John said, you heard that Antichrist shall come, and even now there are many Antichrists. Sometime before he was assassinated on February 21st, 1965, Black nationalist preacher Malcolm X said that the resurrection of Jesus Christ means the resurrection of the black man when he breaks the mental and economic shackles of white imperialism and colonialism. What Malcolm X was saying was the resurrection of Jesus is not a literal historical event. By denying the literal bodily resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, Malcolm X was walking in the spirit of Antichrist. Nobody, hardly anybody loves Malcolm X more than I do for what he did and wanted and tried to do. But theologically speaking, Malcolm X was way off base, way off base. He said the resurrection represents the black man rising up above his slave master, rising above and breaking the shackles of imperial, white imperialism, white supremacy, white imperialism and colonialism. In other words, he denied the resurrection, the literal bodily resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As much as I love and appreciate what Malcolm X did and tried to do for black people, theologically speaking, he embraced the spirit of Antichrist because as a minister of Islam, he proposed an alternative to the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ and his holy apostles and prophets. Cult leaders walk in the spirit of the Antichrist because they too present themselves or someone else as the Messiah, an alternative to the true and living Messiah, Jesus, Yahshua HaMashiach. One such leader was Father Divine. Father Divine and his followers believed that he was the second coming of Christ. He required his followers to adhere to his international modest code, which required a strict commitment to a celibate lifestyle and abstinence from immoral actions. 
but he died in 1965 and he has not been raised from the dead so that kind of that kind of punches a hole in his credibility he died in he born in 1876 10 years after the civil war 11 years after the civil war ended he died in 1965 the same year malcolm x was assassinated to my knowledge he has not been raised from the dead 65, 75, 85, 95, 05, 15, 22. He's been dead 57 years. Jesus stayed dead three days and he rose from the dead. Notice that Father Divine died in 1965, 57 years ago. The Reverend Jim Jones of Lynn, Indiana had over, led over 900 souls to their deaths in Jonestown, Guyana, South America. He also claimed to be God, even though he threatened his followers that if they crossed him, he would meet them in the grave. He said he was God, but he, he, he got upset with his followers and said, I'll meet you in the grave if you, if you, if you cross me. Well, they all went to the grave. <laughs> Whether they met up, I don't know. His toxic mixture of the gospel of Jesus and communistic socialism, along with his phony healing crusades, were typical cultic practices. Again, the spirit of Antichrist pervaded his life and teachings. A man is coming out with a book called I'll Be Your God, the psychobiography of Jim Jones. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading it because I've, I've read several works about you know, Jonestown and what happened there. I study, I study about cults, but the one I study about the most is Jonestown. Cult leader David Koresh of the Branch Davidians, a breakoff sect of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, had the cultic audacity to believe that he, David Koresh, the word Koresh means Cyrus. Remember in the Old Testament, God had an anointed king named Cyrus. Uh, uh, David Koresh, which means Cyrus, God's anointed one, was the only one who could open and interpret the seven sealed scroll of Revelation 5. Remember, Jesus... The, uh, the elders said to John, weep not the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the seven sealed scroll and to look upon its contents. So how could David Koresh think that he could open the seven sealed scroll when only Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the one promised by the Old Testament Hebrew prophets. He was the only one worthy. Who is worthy? John said that heaven, that heaven hired an executive search firm. And they went all through the universe, heaven, earth, and even under the earth, to find someone worthy. And then one stepped forth who looked like a lamb that had been slain, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Here's another one, Marshall Applewhite, cultic leader of Heaven's Gate. He deluded his followers into believing they would be raptured to an extraterrestrial location. Under his command, they too committed suicide, similar to Jonestown, except Jonestown was over 900. They committed suicide in San Diego, California in 1997. It was the largest mass suicide in the United States where the Jonestown massacre took place in, in uh, South America. That was over 900 people. About 300 of them were children. Again, the teachings of this man led others to their deaths. He didn't teach them to die for Jesus as our Lord Jesus taught, but he taught them to believe a toxic combination of pseudoscience mixed with apocalyptic lies. Again, because he taught his followers a different theology than what Jesus our Lord taught his holy apostles and prophets, he possessed the demonic spirit of Antichrist. Read and listen to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. See to it that no one deceives you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, I am the anointed one, I am Yeshua HaMashiach, Joshua the Messiah, and they will deceive many, they will mislead many, many will be deceived, and the deception isn't nearly as bad as it's going to get. Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that Jesus is the promised Messiah of the Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures and the crucified, risen Lord and Savior of the New Testament.
founded in 1872 by Charles Taze Russell, Jehovah's Witnesses, an offshoot of Seventh-day Adventism, identify as Christians, but their beliefs are different from other Christians in some ways. For example, they teach that Jesus is the Son of God, but is not part of a trinity. They don't believe in the trinity, even though the trinity is a concept that's plainly explained in the Bible, even though the word trinity is not in the Bible, but the concept of it is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all three of them are divine. By not believing that Jesus is part of the Holy Trinity, Jehovah's Witnesses have denied the deity of Jesus. Here are 11 things that Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that prove they walk in the spirit of Antichrist. They believe that, that God can only be called Jehovah, that to call him any other name is wrong. When God has many names, I mean many, many different names. Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that the concept of the Trinity is biblical because the word Trinity is not explicitly mentioned in the Bible. Kind of like those who don't believe in the rapture because the word rapture isn't mentioned in the Bible even though the concept is. That, that's weak theology to say something doesn't exist because a specific word does not exist in the Bible. I don't see the word cats in the Bible. Does that mean there were no cats? Concerning the Trinity and each member's deity as a member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, biblically, while it is true that there is only one God, it is also true that three persons are called God in Scripture. The Father, 1 Peter 1 and 2, Jesus, John 20, 28, Hebrews 1, 8, and the Holy Spirit, Acts 5, 3, 4. Each of these three possesses the attributes of deity, including omnipresence, Psalm 139, 7, Jeremiah 23, 23, 24, Matthew 28, 20, omniscience, being having all knowledge, Psalm 147, 5, John 16, 30, 1 Corinthians 2, 10, 11, omnipotence, having all power, Jeremiah 32, 17, John 2, 1 through 11, Romans 15, 19, and eternality, Psalm 90 and 2, Hebrews 9, 14, and Revelation 22 and 13. The Trinity, sharing divine attributes. As it pertains to the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus was created by Jehovah as the Archangel Michael before the physical world existed and as a lesser and is a lesser though mighty God. Biblically, however, Jesus is eternally God. John 1.1, 1, 1, 858, Exodus 3.14, and has the exact same divine nature as the Father. John 5.18, John 10.30, Hebrews 1.3. Indeed, a comparison of the Old and New Testament equates Jesus with Jehovah. Compare Isaiah 43.11 with Titus 2.13, Isaiah 44.24 with Colossians 1.16, Isaiah 6.1-5 with John 12.41. Jesus himself created the angels, Colossians 1, 16, John 1 and 3, Hebrews 1, 2 and 10, and is worshiped by them, Hebrews 1 and 6. Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that Jesus the Christ was God manifested in the flesh. They don't believe in the divine incarnation, the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that when Jesus was born on earth, he was a mere human and not God in human flesh. This violates the biblical teaching that in the incarnate Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Colossians 2, 9, Philippians 2, 6, and 7. It, what it was was Jesus gave up, the, the word of God gave up his outward trappings of, 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 of Shekinah glory and became flesh. John 1 and 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Philippians 2, G, uh, uh, um, um, the word became flesh and, and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that's above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord and God to the glory of God the Father the word for fullness the Greek, Greek word pleroma carries the idea of the sum total deity Greek the, theotes where we get the word like theology, theos, refers to the nature, being, and attributes of God. Therefore, the incarnate Jesus was the sum total of the nature, being, and attributes of God in bodily form. 
Indeed, Jesus was Emmanuel or God with us. Matthew 1, 23, Isaiah 7, 14, John 1 and 1, John 1, 14, John 1, 18, John 10, 30, John 14, 9 and 10. All right, let me fix this one right here. It's, it says something about the resurrection. Jehovah Witnesses do not believe in the physical, literal, bodily resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jehovah Witnesses believe that Jesus was resurrected spiritually from the dead, but not physically. Remember when Jesus was raised from the dead? He showed himself alive for 40 days to about, to about 500 brethren. He also ate among them. He was showing them that it was a physical body that raised from the dead. Here, hey, 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 guys, you got anything to eat? And they gave him a fish and a honeycomb. Jesus literally bodily rose from the dead. Biblically, however, the resurrected Jesus asserted that he, he, he was not merely a spirit, but had a flesh and bone body. Luke 24, 39, John 2, 19 through 21. He ate food on several occasions, thereby proving that he had a genuine physical body after the resurrection. I just, I just talked about him eating fish and honeycomb, etc. Luke 24, 30. Luke 42, I'm sorry, Luke 24, 30, 42 and 43. John 21, 12 and 13. This was confirmed by his followers who physically touched him. Matthew 28, 9. John 20 and 17. Remember, remember uh, uh, Thomas said, I'm not going to believe he's been raised unless I can touch him. A week later, a couple of days later, Jesus said, Thomas, come here. Take your hand, put it in my side and see it's me. And Thomas came under conviction and said, my Lord and my God. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever. All right, I'm going to close in a few minutes. I don't want to do too much tonight. And then I'll continue on Sunday. Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in a literal second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The second coming. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the second coming was an invisible spiritual event that occurred in the year 1914. Biblically, however, the yet future second coming will be physical, visible, Acts 1, 9, 11, Titus 2, 13, and will be accompanied by visible cosmic disturbances. Matthew 24, 29, 30, every eye will see him, Revelation 1, 7. This is when Jesus comes to the earth, literally comes to the earth to destroy the enemies of God and to redeem Israel and, and, and set up the messianic kingdom. This is not describing when Jesus comes in the air for the church, what we call the rapture or what the Greek word, the word is, that's used is the harpazo, the, the sudden snatching away of every believer. All right, let me do a few more minutes and I'm gonna close. Jehovah Witnesses do not believe in the person spoken as he of the Holy Spirit. Jehovah Witnesses believe that the Holy Spirit is an impersonal force of God and not a distinct person. Biblically, however, the Holy Spirit has the three primary attributes of personality, a mind, Romans 8, 27, emotions, Ephesians 4, 30, will, 1 Corinthians 12, 11. Moreover, personal pronouns are used to describe the Holy Spirit, Acts 13 and 2. Also, he does things that only a person can do, including teaching, John 14, 26, testifying, John 15, 26, commissioning, Acts 13, 4, issuing commands, Acts 8, 29, and interceding, Romans 8, 26. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, Matthew 28 and 19. Jehovah Witnesses do not believe in salvation strictly by grace, but also believe that good works, obedience to their edicts, their creeds must be performed in order for someone to be saved. Jehovah Witnesses believe that salvation requires faith in Christ, association with God's organization, i.e. their religion, and obedience to its rules. In other words, they, they teach a works-based salvation, as all cults do. Biblically, however, viewing obedience to rule as a requirement for salvation nullifies the gospel. Galatians 2, 16 through 21. Colossians 2, 20 through 23. Salvation is based wholly on God's unmerited favor, grace, when I think of grace, I think of God's riches at Christ's expense, not on the believer's performance. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He has washed it as white as snow. Good works are the fruit or result, not the basis of salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. The Bible says we're saved by grace through faith. 
and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We are his workmanship created unto good works. We're created, we're saved by grace through faith for the purpose of doing good works that glorify God in Christ. But we are not saved by works. We're saved by God's grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Jesus paid it all on the cross. All to him we owe. Sin had left a very crimson stain. He has washed it as white as snow. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Titus 3, 4 through 8. For some strange reason, Jehovah's Witnesses believe they are included in the 144,000 redeemed individuals in Revelation chapters 7 and 14. But the Bible specifically says that these are Jews out of the 12 tribes of Israel. Jehovah's Witnesses believe there are two peoples of God. The anointed class, the 144,000, will live in heaven and rule with Christ. And the other sheep, all other believers, will live forever on a paradise earth. Biblically, however, a heavenly destiny awaits all who believe in Christ. John 14, 1 through 3, 17, uh, 24, 2 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, excuse me, 5 and 1, Philippians 3, 20, Colossians 1, 5, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, Hebrews 3, 1, and these same people will also dwell on the new earth, 2 Peter 3, 13, and Revelation 21, 1 through 4. The scriptures t teach that mankind is a tripartite being, that he possesses a spirit, a soul, and a body. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 But the Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in the immaterial nature of man. Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that humans have an immaterial nature. The soul is simply the life force within a person. At death, that life force leaves the body. Biblically, however, the word soul is multifaceted. One key meaning of the term is man's immaterial self that consciously survives death. Genesis 35, 18, Revelation 6, 9, and 10, unbelievers are in conscious woe. Matthew 13, 42, Matthew 25, 41, and 46, Luke 16, 22 through 24, Revelation 14, 11, while believers are in conscious bliss in heaven. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, Philippians 1, 21 through 23, and Revelation 7, 17 and 21 and 4. Jehovah's Witnesses make the mistake of teaching that hell and the grave are synonymous. But when our Lord Jesus rose from the dead, he stated, I have the keys of death and Hades. Death and Hades. Hades, and is the conjunction that separates the two entities. Death, death is the gateway to Hades, but death and Hades are different. The Bible says in Revelation, eventually death and Hades will be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. These are apparently two separate entities, death being the means by which unbelievers enter into Hades, the abode of the wicked dead. See also Revelation 20, 13, and 14. Notice in the Revelation 20, 13, 14 passage, death and Hades are even different from the lake of fire. So here we have three separate entities, not even two, death, Hades, and the lake of fire. Jehovah Witnesses believe hell is not a place of eternal suffering, but is rather the common grave of humankind. The wicked are annihilated, so they believe in the annihilation theory, which is not biblical snuffed out of conscious existence forever. Biblically, however, hell is a real place of conscious eternal suffering. Matthew 5, 22, Matthew 25, 41 and 46, Jude 7, Revelation 14, 11, Revelation 20, 10, and Revelation 20 and 14. While certainly not alone, Jehovah's Witnesses are a prime example of a religious organization that has denied the basic doctrines, the cardinal doctrines, the cardinal teachings of the Bible. Five fundamental, fundamental doctrines of Christianity. The Trinity. There is one God in three persons. The person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is fully man and fully God for all eternity. Paul said himself after Jesus had been raised from the dead and ascended back to glory. Paul said there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. He said that after Christ had ascended back to glory and is now seated at, at the right hand of the Father as our great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Scripture alone 
sola scriptura. Scripture alone is, is entirely uh, sufficient for all Christian life. Sola scriptura. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. By grace we are saved. God's riches at Christ's expense. Not grace and. Not, 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 not faith and. We are saved based on what Jesus did on the cross. The Bible says in Hebrews 1 and 3 that when Jesus by himself had purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus paid it all, the songwriter said. All to him we owe. Sin had left a very crimson stain. He has washed it as white as snow. The second coming of Christ is another cardinal doctrine of Christianity. Jesus Christ is coming back first in the rapture, in the harpazo to gather the church. Then he's coming literally back to the earth to judge and to rule, which is the basic theme of the book of the Revelation. All right, I'm going to stop there. And I'll pick up on Sunday with Islam. I'll pick up on Sunday with Islam. The spirit of Antichrist is in cults, but it's also in, listen to this, the spirit of Antichrist is also in New Testament churches. We know this because we saw the spirit of Antichrist in some of the seven churches of Revelation, an alternative to, to, to the biblical Christ, or even antagonistic, antagonistically opposed to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But Jesus alone is our basis for salvation. John said that Antichrist shall come. John said 2,000 years ago, even now, there are many Antichrists. Do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know Jesus Christ, God's Son? Do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know Jesus Christ, God's Son? Won't you serve him? Won't you serve him? Won't you serve Jesus Christ, God's Son? Won't you serve him? Won't you serve him? Won't you serve Jesus Christ, God's Son? Won't you praise him? Won't you praise him? Won't you praise Jesus Christ, God's Son? Won't you praise him? Won't you praise him? Won't you praise Jesus Christ, God's Son? Won't you worship him? Won't you worship him? Won't you worship Jesus Christ, God's Son? Won't you worship Him? Won't you worship Him? Won't you worship Jesus Christ, God's Son? I implore you to discern the Spirit of Christ, which raised Him from the dead. The Spirit of Christ points to Jesus. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, He shall glorify me. He shall take of mine and he shall show it to you. The Holy Spirit points to Jesus. Doesn't point to Crockett. Doesn't point to man, to reverend, to bishop, apostle, prophet, pope, prelate, pastor. The Holy Spirit uses them but points to Jesus. The spirit of Antichrist says, no, there's another way. The spirit of Antichrist says, no, there's another way. Or the spirit of Antichrist says, yes, Jesus, but let's add to it. You cannot add to what Jesus did on the cross. You cannot add to the fact that God Almighty raised him from the dead, literally, bodily, not metaphysically, not spiritually, not emotionally, socially, politically, culturally, but literally, bodily, raised this man, this, 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 this Messiah, this man from Nazareth, raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality of power, might and dominion, and every name that's named in this world and the world to come. God bless you, my beloved. I pray that you made a firm decision for Jesus. Don't you dare give up eternity so you can live your own life for 80, 90, or even 100 years. Don't you dare give up eternity, because if you do, you'll have to live for eternity in the lake of fire with the devil, the beast, the false prophet, and everyone else who has, who has rejected 
our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Won't you accept him as your Lord and Savior? And if you already have accepted him, I want to encourage you to beware of the spirit of Antichrist that is even now in the world. Anything that detracts from the glory, the majesty, the power, the dominion, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ is the spirit of Antichrist. And one day that, that, that Antichrist, John said, that Antichrist, that little horn, that, 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 uh, that, uh, that, that willful king and about 200 other names, that abominator that makes desolate, he shall come. The church will not be here. The church will have been raptured out of the world when he comes. But when he comes, he will take over the world and he will cause all to worship him. And he will cause all small and great, rich and poor to receive a mark in their foreheads or in their hands. And no one will be able to buy or sell unless they have what we call the mark of the beast. I pray that you, if you trust in Christ and become a, a true member of his church, the invisible church, the church made of true believers in Jesus, you will escape that awful time that Jesus said will come upon the earth and be, and be such like that has never been nor ever shall be. Our Lord Jesus Christ said that. Jeremiah said through the, the Lord said through Jeremiah, it will be the time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be delivered from it. Meaning Israel, a remnant of Israel, a remnant of the 12 tribes will be delivered from it. God bless you, my beloved. I could go on and on. You know how I love to, to talk about biblical prophecy, but biblical prophecy is relevant for us today. It's not just some, something about far off in the by and by. Is relevant for us today. God bless you, my beloved. I pray that you trust in Christ. Listen to this in its entirety, and then we'll come again on Sunday at 11 a.m. If you're not already obligated somewhere else, join us at 11 a.m. as we con as we continue to talk about can you discern the spirit of Christ from the spirit of the Antichrist. God bless you, my beloved. We love you, but most importantly, God loves you. You continue to pray for us that we would speak the truth of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you, my beloved. Take care.